Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the Bible Study With Me series we're doing through the book of Esther. Today's video, we are in Esther chapter 7 and this chapter holds a major turning point in the story. Sort of all the buildup and all the story so far has been leading to this pivotal moment. So if you haven't already, make sure you go back and watch the videos we did on chapters one through six. And if you have already watched those videos, leave a comment down below with a gold star emoji. But let's do a little refresher before we get into it. So as a reminder, the book of Esther is a historical narrative that is set in the city of Susa. And so Susa was the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire, this massive empire over which King Ahasuerus is reigning. And it tells the story specifically of a Jewish community living in this empire. And so these are among the people who did not return to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, but remained there again in Susa. And specifically within that, it tells the story of a Jewish maiden living among those people who God uses to save her people. So like we We've been talking about all throughout this book, God's name actually is not mentioned one time throughout this entire book, which is crazy. But although his name isn't in the book, his hand certainly is. And all throughout this story, we've been seeing God just working behind the scenes, setting things in place, moving. And again, in this chapter, we're going to see so many of those things that have been being set up come into play. A little refresher on the theme statement. Again, I got this from the Bible Project. It says, God's seeming absence does not mean he has abandoned his people. He uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people living in a messy world to accomplish his purposes and fulfill his promises. This book asks us to trust God even when we can't see him working and to hold to the confident hope that no matter how bad things get, God is actively working to redeem his world. I say this in every video, but I always get the questions. I just want to note that the Bible Project and all the other resources I reference, whether that be sermons, my Bible, highlighters, journals, commentaries, any of that, all of that is linked down below in the description. So you can just click through to see where I got all of those things. But now let's do a little refresher on the story. Let's get us caught up to where we are at this point. So as the book opens, we have King Ahasuerus who again is the king of this ancient Persian empire. And he asks his wife, Queen Vashti, to parade her beauty in front of his drunken friends at the tail end of this ginormous six month party that he threw. And she refuses, so she's kicked out of the role of queen. And then King Ahasuerus holds essentially this giant beauty contest to select a new queen. And that is where we have Queen Esther chosen as the new queen. And then after that, we have this guy named Haman, who the king appoints to this high position in his court. And Haman is mad because Mordecai, who is Esther's cousin, won't bow down to him, even though everyone else is bowing down to him. And so he devises a plot to kill the Jews because Mordecai is a Jew. And then he casts lots to determine when this plan is gonna go into effect. And it's determined that this plan to destroy the Jews is gonna go into effect 11 months from then. And so then we have that key point in the story where Esther risks her life to go before the king because she hasn't been invited, but he grants her to come in and instead of immediately revealing her ultimate request, instead Esther first requests to have a banquet with Haman and the king. And so Haman goes home after that first feast, just excited about all these accolades and the honor and everything that he is getting. But he has this plan in his heart to have Mordecai hanged because even with all these accolades, they meant nothing to him if there was still this one man who was unwilling to praise him. And we talked a lot about just the human nature in that in those chapters. And so the night before the second feast, again, this is the night before that day that the second feast is going to happen. Also the night before when Haman is planning to hang Mordecai. The night before that feast, King Ahasuerus can't sleep, which was not a coincidental insomnia because then he goes to read the Book of Remembrance and recalls how Mordecai 
Mordecai had basically spoiled a plot to kill the king. And so he essentially saved the king's life. And the king is reading about this in this book of the Chronicles and realizes that Mordecai has never been properly recognized or honored for this act. And so just as he is thinking through this, he sees Haman entering into the court, which the ironic part is that Haman is actually coming into the court to ask about having Mordecai hanged. But the king sees Haman there and summons him in and says, hey, Haman, what would you do for the man who the king seeks to honor? And Haman says, who else would the king seek to honor? but me. And so he comes up with this elaborate plan to have this person paraded around the city. And much to his surprise, the king says, great, now go do all of that for Mordecai. So after the parade, Haman walks home with his head hung in shame. And he's telling his wife and his friends about this. And they're basically saying, look, you're not going to be able to overcome this guy. And as they are talking, the king's eunuchs take Haman away to bring him to the second feast. And that is exactly Exactly where chapter 7 opens up. Chapter 7 is pretty short, only 10 verses long, and it's split up into two subheadings. The first one is Esther reveals Haman's plot, and that covers verses 1 through 6. And then the second subheading, spoiler alert, is Haman is hanged, and that covers verses 7 through 10. So a little preview of what is coming. But like we've been doing throughout this whole series, we're just going to read through the entire chapter without stopping and then go back and unpack it and kind of pull out those principles that it is teaching us and things that it is revealing to us about God. And so we're just going to go ahead and get into it. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. That is a huge way that you can help to support me and help me to continue to make these Bible study with me series. And if you've been enjoying this one, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and let's just go ahead and get into it. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Esther chapter seven. Verse 1. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said again to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. All right, so let's go ahead and unpack that. 
Like I said, Esther 7 is a major turning point in the story. If this was a movie, I imagine it's just that moment where that thing that the viewer has known all along is finally revealed to the king and to Haman and everybody is just shocked. And it's just this turning climactic point in the story. And so it opens with the king and Haman going into feast with Queen Esther. And then in verse two, it says on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast. And so this kind of raised the question in my head of, was this a two day feast? And it doesn't really specify, but it seems like it might have been that it was this thing that lingered on a little bit. And it just made me think about how anxious Haman must have been that entire time, because he already knows that the tides are kind of turning, that Mordecai has been honored because he saved the king and he knows what he's been plotting. And so he, maybe doesn't suspect that anything will happen here at the feast, but I just imagine that he would have felt really nervous. And so the second day, it says after the feast, as they were drinking wine, the king makes the same offer to Esther of saying, what is your request? I will grant you anything up to half of my kingdom. And so then in verse three, Esther finally reveals her ultimate request. So remember when she's first asked, she says, let's have a banquet with the king and Haman. And then she's asked again and she asks for another banquet. And so now on this third offer, she finally reveals her ultimate request. And it is this, let my life and the lives of my people be saved. A note on this from the Enduring Word commentary says that Esther even when she finally made her request, showed great tact. She did not immediately identify herself as a Jew who was targeted for massacre, even as Haman also hid the identity of the group he targeted when he made his request in Esther chapter three. So if you remember when Haman first presents to the king this idea to have a plot to kill the Jews, he was super vague about it. He used terms like a certain people. He doesn't even specifically identify the Jews. And likewise here, when Esther says, let my people be saved, she doesn't immediately say, hey, I'm a Jew. And remember this decree, like we're all gonna die. She just says, my people are under attack. Let us be saved. Another note from the Enduring Word commentary says that Esther also showed wisdom in how she framed her request. She appealed on a personal basis, knowing that she has never done anything but please the king. And so she didn't just say, save my people. She didn't just say again, save the Jews. She said, let my life be spared and kind of aligning herself with her people and recognizing that if they were gonna be annihilated, that she was a part of that. And then she goes on and says something a little curious. She said, if we had been sold as slaves, I would have stayed silent for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. And a note on this from my study Bible says, with this exaggerated comparison, Esther, like Haman, appeals to the king's self-interest. If he reduced the Jews to slavery, he would have at least had the benefit of their free labor. By killing them, he will lose a valuable asset. And so Esther sort of appeals to the selfishness of the king saying, look, if we had just been sold into slavery, I wouldn't have said anything because at least we would have been giving you free labor, but they're looking to kill us. And so this is gonna be a loss to you no matter what. And so she kind of shows him how it would be to his benefit for her and her people to be saved. And so she says all of this and then the king says, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And if you look at the word dare there, the Hebrew of that word actually means whose heart has filled him to do this. And so he's essentially saying, who is he whose heart has been filled to do this? And it's again, this picture of Haman's heart being filled with anger, filled with rage and this desire to kill. Another note from the Enduring Word commentary on that part of the verse where the king says, who is this wicked man? It says, Ahasuerus perhaps should have known that it was actually he himself who authorized such a plan. He was the one who gave authorization to Haman to carry out this plot. 
though he did it in ignorance. So again, we talked about how when Haman presents this plot, he was super vague in it, and the king kind of just willy-nilly approved this. And again, that speaks to what we've been talking about kind of throughout this series on this character development of King Ahasuerus, that we tend to see him being pretty reactive, pretty impulsive. And so this super vague plan is presented to him to destroy this people group. And without really prying for more details to our knowledge, he approves it. And so when he's now saying, who did this? In reality, he should know, but because of his ignorance in approving this plan, he didn't. And then Esther responds and says, a foe and an enemy, or in other translations, an adversary and enemy, it is this wicked Haman. And this is just that moment in the story where there's this buildup, there's this buildup, Haman's probably sitting there like, oh shoot, I know what they're talking about. And then Esther points at him and says, it is him. And Esther here is exposing the truth about Haman, that he wasn't this faithful servant to the king, but instead he was an adversary and an enemy who was more interested in his own fame and his own status than the benefit of the king. And so now it says in verse six that Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. He never imagined that Esther was a Jew because remember she had kept this part of her identity hidden, but now he stood before the king being rightly accused of plotting the murder of the king's wife. And so at this point, the king gets up. It says in verse seven that he arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden, maybe to sort of get a breather, to compose himself. But it says that the king was filled with wrath. And another note from the Enduring Word commentary says, this is probably because he now realized that Haman had played him for a dupe in getting this decree to kill the Jews put into effect. And so now Haman is begging for his life from Queen Esther. And when King Ahasuerus walks back in, it appears he is assaulting the queen. I imagine maybe he's kind of at the foot of Esther's couch or something begging for his life. And the king walks in and already kind of being enraged at Haman, sees it as maybe Haman trying to take a pass at Queen Esther. And so he's enraged all the more. And that's kind of what it was saying in this note from my study Bible on verse eight, that Haman was probably kneeling, perhaps with his hands or arms on the couch, probably to seek mercy from Esther. But the king's perception is distorted by his anger. And he takes Haman's move as an assault on Esther. And so the king says, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? And then it says, as the words left his mouth, they covered Haman's face, which is something that they would traditionally do to prepare someone who has been convicted for their execution. And so it was like, final straw, his face is getting covered, he is going to be executed. And then it says, Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs. Notice throughout this story how many eunuchs of the king are referenced in kind of their key roles throughout the story. But Harbona, this eunuch of the king, said, hey, I don't know if you guys realized this, but the gallows that Haman prepared for Mordecai, whose word, by the way, mind you, saved the king, remember, it's standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And so he doesn't even say like, hey, we should hang Haman on these gallows. He just kind of throws it out there that the gallows exist and their intended victim was Mordecai, but Mordecai was actually the hero. And the king takes this knowledge and says, hang him on that. And then it says, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And there's so much irony and so much of a twist in that one sentence that the very gallows he had prepared for Mordecai are now being used on him. And I think this really illustrates the principle here that no evil will ultimately go unpunished. And sometimes God uses our own very selfish ambition or evil or malicious acts to kind of be turned on ourselves. Psalm 7, 14 through 16 says, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hold that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, 
and on his own skull, his violence descends. There's kind of a funny story from during quarantine when all of the lockdowns were really happening and we were holding youth group for our church over like Zoom and just, you know, Instagram lives and all of that kind of stuff. And this is actually when Tyler and I were first kind of talking, but there was this giant debate among the leaders of our youth group on whether or not pineapple belongs on pizza, which by the way, it does not comment down below what you think, but there was this debate going and somebody was like, we should do an Instagram poll. And they had me do one. And I was like, look, I'm gonna finally prove to all you guys because Tyler especially was and is on the camp that it does belong on pizza. I was like, I'm gonna use this Instagram poll to finally prove to you guys that pineapple does not belong on pizza. And so I put this on my own Instagram and y'all betrayed me if you follow me on Instagram because there were more votes that it did belong on pizza than it didn't. And I texted our leader chat and I was like, I feel like Haman that I thought these gallows were gonna be used to, you know, finally convince Tyler that he is wrong about pineapple on pizza, but instead I'm getting hanged on my own gallows because everyone's saying that it does. Just kind of a funny story, but it's just this idea that as we plot evil and that as we're full of malice that sometimes God will allow that to lead to our own detriment and for those things to be used against us and we see that very clearly here with Haman. Another note from the Enduring Word commentary is that this whole ordeal with Haman and the gallows and Mordecai, that it ultimately points us forward because Satan thought that he had won by getting the crowd to crucify Jesus, but the cross turned out to be the instrument of his defeat. And so in the case of Mordecai and Haman, it's a matter of the guilty dying in place of the innocent. But in the case of us and Jesus, it is the innocent dying in place of the guilty. And not only that, it is him choosing to do so. Jesus choosing to lay down his life for us. And so that is something that this ultimately points us forward to. And so Haman is hanged on the gallows prepared for Mordecai. And then the final line in this chapter says, then the wrath of the king abated. That is all for Esther chapter seven. We're not gonna be doing a further study this time. Again, it's just more narrative based. And so just be praying through this processing, asking God what he is speaking to you and showing to you through this chapter and I would love to hear any thoughts you have down in the comments below or just anything new that you learned. Again, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and share it with a friend who you think would wanna go through it as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you back here next week for Esther chapter eight, bye.